Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, Cyprus. So, yeah, so I'm a colleague of Rupert, along with Sergi at STFC's Hartree Centre. And Cyclone as a whole is developed by us, but it's also developed by Eva and Chris at the UK Met Office and Jörg Henriks at the Australian Bureau of Meteorology. So quite a lot of what I'll talk about is joint work with them. So how do I move on? I don't do that. I do that. There we go. Right. So this is what I'm going to talk about this morning. So I'll very briefly touch on motivation, although obviously that's already been done really in the preceding talks. Then I'll talk through Cyclone. So what it is, what it does, um, its two modes of operation. And then I'll say a little bit about levels of abstraction, because it's important to understand that when we talk about more concrete examples. And then I'll move on to talking about our two main domains in Cyfric, Cyfric, in Cyclone. So we have Elfric which is the Met Office, the UK Met Office's new atmosphere model. And then there's the Nemo Ocean model. And then at the end, I'll briefly touch on other things that I haven't had time to talk about in this presentation. So motivation. So Rupert kindly gave the talk on the three P's, the performance, portability and productivity. So hopefully by now you're convinced that when you have a complex parallel code, and an increasingly complex landscape of different parallel computers that Simon talked about and complex compilers, which we haven't talked about. But if you've done any programming, you'll know that compilers don't always work the way you think they should. You very quickly end up with this very complicated optimization space to which there's unlikely to be a single solution. So you're just not going to be able to get um, a single source of truth, a single source optimized code that will run well on a variety of machines. So the solution to this, we we suggest, or one of the solutions to this, is to separate the science specification from the code that's dealing with the high performance aspects. So Cyclone. Cyclone is a domain-specific compiler for embedded domain-specific languages. So embedded here means that it's a domain-specific language, but it's embedded in, in this case, Fortran, although it could be embedded in some other language. It is configurable, so it supports finite difference slash finite volume type domains such as Nemo and uh, GeoCean API, but it also supports uh, the mixed finite element scheme used in the Elfric model. Currently, we are primarily a DSL embedded in Fortran that then produces optimized Fortran. Um, possibly with some open CR functionality. I'll mention that briefly later on. We have support for both distributed memory and shared memory parallelism, so OpenMP and MPI, essentially. And Cyclone supports both code generation, so generating code from scratch, and also transforming existing code. Cyclone aims to be a tool for use by HPC experts. Um, it doesn't aim to be a black box that produces optimized code for you there and then. It expects to uh, use a human's intuition and skill in order to produce that optimized code. So, and as it is a tool, it enables the HPC expert to work around any compiler limitations or bugs so that if it's discovered that some form of code doesn't work well with a particular compiler, then you might need to transform that wherever that code occurs into some other form that does work well with the compiler. The optimizations that you provide that Cyclone performs are provided to Cyclone as a recipe or a Cyclone script. So they're no longer hard baked into the scientific source code. So you no longer end up with your, am I doing OpenAC? Am I doing OpenMP? Uh, here's my open app directives. Here are my open ACC directives. None of that appears in your code anymore. That's all captured. Um, your, the choice is whether you're doing OpenAC or OpenMP are all captured in that recipe. And then, of course, once you've made that separation, you are then free to have different recipes, different scripts for different computer architectures. So if you have some supercomputer that's GPU based and you want to produce some optimized open act code, then your, your script for doing that will look different to the one that you might do for using OpenMP, for instance. Essentially, the, the takeaway line here, I think, is that Cyclone aims to provide um, or aims to make it possible to do scriptable whole code, whole code optimization. So you, you write one script and then you apply that script to your whole source code base, source base, um, to produce the optimized code for a particular computing platform. And I can't press that key, I need to press that key. There we are. So um, in terms of its basic structure, Cyclone looks like this. <clears throat> 
Um, you start off with Fortran primarily on the left hand side. Um, that is parsed by a Fortran parser called fParser, which I'll talk a little bit about in a minute. And then that is then, once we have that representation of the code, we then use one of our front end. So if you're using the Elfric atmosphere type model, then obviously it goes into the Elfric front end. The Elfric front end then produces a cyclone intermediate representation. So a high level representation of the code, excuse me, of the operations that are being performed in a tree-like structure and that's our cyclone internal representation that green oval in the middle and it's at that level that the uh, the HPC expert then applies cyclone transformation so that internal representation is then transformed maybe to add in open act directives maybe to add open MP maybe to do something more sophisticated with distributed memory and then once the the HPC expert is happy that the, the the CIR is now in a form that they want. Then the back end, then that's then passed to a back end, which then produces Fortran again. And then you give that to your normal compiler. Obviously, once you're in that CIR, there are other options to you. You could go to OpenCL. You could, as Rupert mentioned, start investigating how you might map to the other intermediate representations, such as that used by Dawn, which is the SIR. Uh, but in this talk, I'm primarily going to be talking about things that generate Fortran. So those other two options are greyed out there. And then, as you'll see on the left, there, there are two other front ends. There's the GeoCean front end, Nemo front end. And I'll say a bit more about those later on. So just a slide on FParser, just so that you are aware of what it is. It is a Fortran parser written purely in Python. So it's very easy to install. Um, it's open source, it's available on GitHub, <coughs> excuse me, and as of now, it can fully pass the, the Met Office's unified model code, it can fully pass the Elfric atmosphere model, and it can pass the Nemo source. And we have some work in progress to fix some bugs related to passing the IFS model from ECMWF, and it's used by um, a number of tools. And essentially, its job is to take Fortran, such as you might see in the top there, this copy stencil routine with its nested loops, and it generates a, a tree view of that code. So at the top here, you can see there's an execution part, and then underneath that, there's your opening do block, and then on down here, and all of these things map back into the Fortran standard. So that's the kind of representation that Cyclone works on. So now that you're aware of FParser, I can move on. So Cyclone essentially has two modes of operation, um, as we've already discussed there's revolution and there's evolution. So revolution is where we started, really. Um, and revolution means it's a revolution in how the scientists write their code. They must write their code in a domain specific language. And currently Cyclone supports two of those domains. Uh, our primary one is Elfric, and that is obviously developed for the Met Office's Elfric model. It supports mixed finite elements on a mesh that is unstructured in the horizontal but is structured in the vertical. And that's a language that's embedded in Fortran, as you'll see when I get to the examples. And then we have the GeoCean domain, which is similar to Elfric. It still has the same separation of concerns, but it's primarily for finite difference and currently only supports two dimensional problems. And that's really uh, the API. It's a much simpler API than Elfric and it's the one we use for sort of prototyping work and, and developing our ideas. And then second to the revolution approach, we have the evolution approach. And this really came about through the discovery. I say discovery, it seems fairly obvious when you think about it, that scientists don't really want to have to rewrite hundreds of thousands of lines of code if they don't have to. And so if you've got existing code that follows strict coding conventions and you know that it's, say, a stencil-based code, you know the kind of operations it's doing, then it's possible to take the parsed representation of that code to recognize certain structures within it and then produce a construct a higher level internal representation to which you then apply the transformations as I talked about in the previous slide and then you generate new code out of the, the back end and so that mode of operation is in development for Nemo primarily in Cyclone uh, and its associated model so Nemo also has uses a sea ice model and other biogeochemical tracer models um, and all of those things are in scope for what Cyclone will tackle. 
and it's also been applied to the ROMS ocean model. <clears throat> Excuse me. No, I'll get used to doing that in a minute. Right. So levels of abstraction. Rupert actually talked a little bit about this. So when we're talking about it's all about cyclone is all about moving up and down the levels of abstraction here, really. So if you are writing Elfric code, you are already writing in a domain specific language. So you're up in the Elfric intermediate representation that then gets mapped down into this language independent cyclone intermediate represent internal representation so language independent means that at this point you don't care whether it's fortran or c or c plus plus or whatever language it's it's just a way of representing procedural code and then from there you map down into language specific so at that point you make a choice and you say i want fortran or i want c and i want to add open out to it so fairly obviously the word the level at the top these are domain specific languages and then anything below this line is not a domain specific language below this line we're talking about either we're always, we're always talking about representing code whether it's language independent or language specific so that's just a picture that we will refer back to as we go through so um, i'm going to talk about the elfric domain now and if you remember, this one is revolution. So this requires the scientists to write their code in a DSL from scratch. And that code must follow what we call the SciCal separation of concerns. And that's illustrated in this picture here. So the, the scientist, the domain scientist, the natural scientist is responsible for writing the algorithm and the kernels in this view. So the algorithm says, I have this field and I want to perform this operation on it. And then maybe I want to add it to another field. There's no concept there of how those fields are represented on the computer or whether they're in fact shared amongst multiple computers. At the bottom level is the kernel and the kernel is where the scientist specifies the how the computation is actually to be done on the field. And that's written in terms of maybe what computation you do in a single cell or on a single column of cells. In the middle, you have what we call the parallel system and Obviously, if the top level algorithm doesn't know anything about um, how a field is distributed amongst your processors and the bottom kernel level only worries about a single cell or column of a field, then it's the job of the parallel system to loop over all the cells in your model and pass the information down to the kernel for computation. And that's typically where you have to do all of your parallel programming. And that's where the computational scientist would typically work. So you have these three layers that facilitate the this the um, the separation of concerns and then cyclone's role really in this is to generate the parallel system layer code so in the in the um, layers of abstraction view it looks like this so the the domain scientist writes their algorithm and kernel code or kernel metadata as well in fortran that is turned into the Elfric intermediate representation in Cyclone. The HPC expert then applies transformations to that internal representation. And when they're happy and they're done, that gets mapped down into the Cyclone internal representation. And then finally, that comes out as parallel Fortran code and potentially other languages, but at the minute, just Fortran code. So in code, this is what that would look like. So in the algorithm layer, you have these, these field objects. Uh, they're a Fortran derived type, and there's no information here about how they're, they're, how they're spread over the processes in your computer or anything like that. They're just fields. Um, and then obviously you need to perform operations on those fields. And in the DSL, that's done by saying, you want to invoke these kernels. So there's a call invoke, and then there's a list of these kernels that you want to, that the scientific user wants to apply and the fields that they want to apply the kernels to. And essentially it's saying that you have these kernels and you want to um, execute them in some way on your target machine. And you're not saying how you want to execute them, simply that you want them to be executed in that order. Obviously, in order to work out how to call the kernels and what the data dependencies are, there needs to be some description of what the kernels do. And 
the scientific user has to provide that as metadata. So for instance, for, for the last kernel in invoke there, the apply variable HX kernel type, um, it has a lot of arguments and the user has to specify whether they're fields or whether they're operators or whether they're scalars, um, how they're accessed and what function spaces they're on, which is important for determining dependencies between them. And this is also saying that this kernel iterates over cells, so it's operating on a column of cells. And finally, this metadata has a link to the actual name of subroutine that contains the implementation of this kernel. So given the kernel metadata and the invoke in the algorithm layer, Cyclone is able to generate the, what I've called the vanilla Cylayer code. So this is the code that will run, but it will run in serial. Um, there's no optimizations applied to this. So you can see uh, there's a loop up here over the degrees of freedom, and it's setting this field grad P to zero. And then there's a much more complicated loop over cells, applying this user supplied kernel scale matrix to code. And you can see that we're no longer simply passing in just the fields. We have to supply a whole lot more information. So the number of vertical levels in the mesh, for instance, the number of degrees of freedom of the field and then various apps so that you can find out where in the mesh you are and all of that information is um, provided by cyclone so precisely so that the scientific developer doesn't have to worry about it. so they you know the, that reduces one one possible source of errors because this is all generated for them so that's the vanilla file code so that's what you get if you don't um, apply any transformations so then the natural thing you would want to do is to transform that. So this, I'm going to talk through an example now from one of the examples distributed with Cyclone. So if you download Cyclone and go to the examples directory, you'll find there's a whole load of material. And under Elfric, there is EG. And I'll show this as a very simple example. Um, the invoke in this case simply calls one kernel. So it calls this kernel called W3 solver the kernel type and it passes it in some fields and also in this case a quadrature object but don't worry too much about that and cyclone will construct the internal representation of that um, invoke so an invoke a schedule an invoke schedule and that invoke schedule in this case has a single loop that is over on a function space of w3 and then it's calling this kernel the solver w3 code and passing it in these fields so that's the, the unoptimized internal representation of that loop. once you got to that point you can then apply transformations to it so um, i realized as i was going through my slides that this transformation script is rather complicated so basically don't worry too much about most of the details um, all that you need to worry about really is this bit down here. So we get hold of the, the schedule in our internal representation. We loop over the children in that schedule. And if we find a loop and depending on whether the type the loop type is over colors or not, you apply a slightly different form of OpenMP transformation. So basically you go through your, your internal representation, find the loops and transform them as you wish. And after you've done that, the, the transformed cyclone internal representation looks very much like it did before, except that now you'll see up here in green, there is this OpenMP parallel do directive, and that then closes this loop that we had before. So with this loop and it's on the W3 function space, and now that's going to be executed in parallel with OpenMP. Or maybe you might do something with OpenAC there if you were targeting a GPU instead. So that's the, the basic idea. Um, obviously, the, the generated code then contains the directive. So before there were no directives in here. Now you've got this OpenMP parallel. It's setting up the various things that it needs to do. And then you close that with an end parallel. So that is generated code. The user doesn't need to worry about that. And obviously, in the algorithm, the algorithm there itself is written in the DSL. There was that call in MOOC, um, that call invoke doesn't exist there's no subroutine in the Fortran code called invoke so instead you have to replace call invoke with a call to the generated codes to the code that the cyclone has generated so cyclone 
transform the algorithm there so that instead of call invoke, you know, have the call invoke, blah, 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 blah. And that is calling essentially the generated code. So that was the Elfric domain. That was trans, that was a uh, revolution uh, because you have to start with the DSL. In the Nemo domain, Nemo is different. Nemo is an existing OSHA model. It's developed by um, quite a large consortium, of various people from around Europe. And as Rupert discussed in the three Ps, they are quite conservative. They're very concerned about um, maintenance, really. And therefore, there are no directives or of any kind in the Nemo code. And they're not willing to rewrite in the DSL at that stage. So the question then was, how would we apply this item in that case? And so in that case, when you have existing code, this is how the, the levels of abstraction look. So you're starting in this case, instead of starting at the top, you're starting at the bottom. You're starting with a model that's written in Fortran, but it follows very strict coding guidelines. And we know that it's a, a stencil based ocean model doing finite difference on the on the global domain. So the Fortran code is parsed by the Fortran parser. Um, the parse tree produced by Fortran parser is then processed again to produce um, our cyclo intermediate representation. And then from that, we go up to the Nemo um, inter representation. Um, so, for instance, if we see a loop over JK down here, we know that because this Nemo and because of the coding mentions that that is actually a loop over the number of vertical levels in the model. So, that kind of information gets up to here. And once we're up here, then we apply transformations as we do in the alpha domain. So you might transform a loop to add open and to it, for instance. And then once you finish doing the transformations, you go back down to the cyclo intermediate representation and then back out to, in this case, we're trying with added directives. So before I shall talk through an example, of that. and this example is taken from EG2 in the no examples of the directory of cyclo. So the original code is one of the ones that all pops up when you profile Nemo when you run it, and that's it's to do with the oh I've got a typo there, apologies. It's to do with the tracer diffusion. So tracer Nemo are things like temperature and salinity. Um, so we have in this Fortran here, we have a loop over tracers at the top, and then we have various work arrays being zeroed, and then we have this loop that's performing the horizontal, calculating the horizontal tracer gradient here. So that's the kind of Fortran that is presented to Fortran parser. The Fortran parser parses it, and then Cyclone works on that parse representation to construct this Cyclone intermediate representation. So I'm just showing a fragment of it here because it gets quite verbose, because it's really intended for the computer and not for the human. but you have here a loop over vertical levels, for instance, and then a loop over latitude, and then a loop over longitude. And within that nested loop, you have what we call an inline kernel, because the Fortran code exists within the loops, and that performs some mathematical operations. So we have that representation, and, and when now we, we do some reasoning, because we know that we have loops over longitude, latitude levels, and we can take action as we see fit. So. Um, and as before, we need a transformation script in order to do that. So this is a lot simpler for Elfric. So it's a bit easier to understand. Essentially, again, we get the schedule for the invoke that we're interested in. So there's a, uh, in, in the Nemo world, an invoke means a subroutine, essentially. So we have a subroutine that performs some work. We have the schedule of that subroutine. In this case, we're going to apply OpenP again, because it's the simplest one. And so we simply loop overall loops we can find in our schedule. And we look for all of those loops that are over vertical levels, because we've decided that's what we're going to parallelize. And we parallelize each of those loops over vertical levels using our transformation. And then when we're done, we return the modified um, site. So once we've done that, after, um, again, all we've ended up with is a single directive, because there was only one loop over levels in the fragment that I'm showing you. So this loop over levels has now been parallelized using an open MP parallel do. And the resulting code that comes out looks like it did before, but with all the comments stripped out and has had these directives added. So now you've got an open MP parallel do acting on this loop over JK. 
of an OpenMP n parallel do at the end. So um, the length of this talk is such that it's only possible really to just give you a brief introduction to Cyclone and its OES modes of operation. The, some of the things that I haven't talked about are what transformations are available to you. So once you've got CIIR representation, um, what can you do to it? Well, you can do loop fusion. You can apply OpenMP, as I have showed you. You can apply OpenACC in order to target NVIDIA GUs. Um, we have some support for OpenCL, but that's really still a work in progress. And there are more sophisticated things you can do to do with optimizing how you run distributed memory machines. Besides the transformations, there are other things that we can do. So we have the Data API, which essentially allows the HPC user to insert calipers at any point in the CIIR. And once you've inserted those calipers, they, they can perform a variety of purposes. So the most obvious one really is profiling. So you want to start a timer at a point and stop a timer at that point. Well, we can do that automatically in an increment. You write a script and say, I want to maybe profile around all of these loops that are of this quantity. And then you build it, run it, and you get profiling information out in using the tool of choice. So this picture in the bottom left here is a timeline of Nemo running on uh, an NVIDIA GPU using the NVIDIA Visual Profiler. And you can see you've got these repeat structures as it time steps through. And all of that markup has been added to Cyclone when it processed the code. But then as profiling, you might want to do debugging. You might want to do validation. So I want to check that it provides a way of checking that the kernel method claims that only writes to this field that that is in fact what happens and none of the other quantities that go into it get modified. Um, you might want to do online visualization, so you might want to be able to push it out to disk or to a network in order to, to visualize on some remote machine. And all these things are possible through the, the side data API. And then we also have um, the option to view a schedule as a directed acyclic graph, which is the picture on the right hand side. And that kind of visualization is useful if you're trying to work out how to optimize a schedule. Um, it tells you where you've got where you've got the opportunity to overlap operations, for instance, and that kind of thing, which is useful as an optimization expert. Um, right. So in summary, Cyclone is the main specifier for use with both following a domain specific language, so that's revolution, and also existing code. The caveat that the existing code has to be um, in a domain that we understand and follow strict coding conventions. It's intended as a tool for use by an HPC expert. It's not a black box. Um, it's initially been developed support and continues to be developed in support of the MetOffice Ulfric model, so that's in revolution mode. Um, and as I've said, it also tackles this difference code. The way it does both of those things is that we construct a Cyclone internal representation, and that's what is transformed by the Cyclone and the scripts written by the user. And then at the other end, you get Fortran or possibly OpenCL of the transformed Cyclone intermediate representation. No, I keep pressing that. I meant to press that. Right, so thank you very much for your attention. Um, the U developer and reference guides are all available on read the docs. So if you have more technical questions, then you can have a look at those. You're very welcome to email either myself or Rupert, and we will do our best to answer your questions. And then, as I said on the way through, there are examples in the Cyclone repository. So as well as the tutorial, we'll be doing this, doing, I was going to say this afternoon, it's not this afternoon, doing in a short while. There are also the examples that come along with something that you can take a look at if you want to investigate further. So thank you. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Andy. Can, you, can you hear me? Great. Yeah. Uh, I was, um, it, says, it says reload session. So I'm just going to ignore that in case anything goes wrong. <clears throat> OK, brilliant. Um, I, I don't see. Um, any questions? Anyone got um, any questions? We maybe. I mean, we're just on time, so uh, so if not, we'll move on. Um, for me, it was very clear, but then I guess I understand it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the danger, isn't it? Yeah.
Okay, if we if we don't have any uh, any questions and if my <coughs> chat is working, then I think we'll just move straight on. Ah, okay, we have someone from Sam. <coughs> so so thank you, Sam. Um, Sam's um, <coughs> Andy. Sam's asking, what processes do you have in place to learn from Cyclone's outputs um, and improve Cyclone in the future? So so I'm guessing this is the performance um, of of the code and how we improve it. The Zoom abilities. I'll answer that question. <laughs> so, yes, that's a good question, and that is key to how we develop Cyclone. Really, so our motive, our strategy with Cyclone is generally to produce something that will execute, and then give that code to an expert and get them to tell us how it would be better. So, particularly when it comes to GPUs, for instance, none of us, and certainly neither Rupert nor myself, are experts on GPU performance. So. Our strategy has been to generate code. So, for instance, with Nemo, we generate GPU accelerated Nemo, and then we show that or show the problematic bits of that to an expert from NVIDIA. They advise on, you know, it would be better actually if you put this additional content in, or it'd be better if you didn't do that. And then to their mission and feed that into cyclone development so that we do the right things to get better code, basically. Does that answer the question? Great. Great. Um, so that so that has answered the question. Brilliant. Um, so uh, we have a question from I hope Jean is the right way of saying this. Apologies if not. Um, what kind of performance improvement can you expect from an evolution? And have you got any example figures? Um, so with evolution, our best our driving case really is Nemo and is getting Nemo to work on a GPU because at the minute, as Rupert said in his presentation, Nemo won't run on GPU default. There's no way you could get it to run on a GPU. So um, in a sense, as soon as we are running on a GPU and running clusters on a CPU, then we're already winning to a certain point in that you have you know, performance portability. If somebody told you you had to run on a GPU based machine, you wouldn't be completely stuck. Um, so that's our sort of fresh for success, if you like. And at the minute, we have Ocean only Nemo running at about twice the speed of a decent Intel Skylake CPU on a single NVIDIA V100 GPU. So that's the best that we can do at the minute, but we're constantly improving on that. I did put NVIDIA effect. Great, thanks, Andy. I think in the interest of time, we should move on now. If, if anyone does have any questions, please add those uh, into the chat and we can try and answer those as, uh, as time goes on. Okay, we should uh, we should move on now. Um, so we're now going to have Giacomo um, <coughs> from Meteo Swiss, and he's going to introduce the Dawn DSL. <coughs> 